Okay. Say something. Nope. Uh, the audio is definitely broken again. Now say something. Time with the audio issues. There we go. The audio seems to be working now. All right. Awesome. Yeah, I almost feel like we got to have whoever is the poor soul stuck with jockeying this in the future almost needs to have two laptops, like one with like Twitch and everything going and one with just like OBS and Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. That's nothing can confuse OBS's tiny little brain. <laughs> but then the problem is when you forget to mute that thing and then this thing and then there's one of your tabs is doing the wrong noise and you're like, oh, oh, this is wrong. Yep. Sven, you're being heroic. <laughs> it's just. Yep. We are Very live, by the way. Oh. The internet is listening to us talk. So enjoying the banter. You're still being heroic. Yes. Yeah. So for those of you um, watching, uh, Sven has been the, the main guy troubleshooting all of the audio issues and, and fighting with the stream for basically all of DEF CON. And it's a testament to his hard work that things have gone as smoothly as they have. So You made it a lot easier that things were pre-recorded because can you, can you imagine trying to hunt people down, hunt speakers down, and then mm -hmm. their sharing is not quite right and all that? Yeah, no, I mean, I mean, this year, at least they're not passed out in the bar. <laughs> <laughs> How many speakers have been passed out in the bar? None of ours that I know of, but we've definitely hooked a few of them out from the nearest bar. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. Um, so expecting anyone else or we want to get this uh, show on the road? Yeah, let me, uh, well. Let me pull up this the thing for myself. Uh, I'm going to try a new layout as soon as I can find the thing. Uh, so while I'm looking for it, uh, Rich, do you want to introduce the paper to everyone? Oh, sorry. Uh, so we're going to do a couple things. Uh, hi, Barton. Uh, so we're going to start with just the four of us talking about it for a bit, and then I'm going to open up the uh, and join the voice chat in the uh, DEF CON Discord, and so you guys will be able to talk on stream and talk with us and everything. Um, so for the first, like, 20 minutes, it's going to be just us, and then we'll bring everyone we can in and have a bit more of a Wild West thing. I'm going to try out how that works. Uh, and the other thing is I'm just going to play with the layouts a little bit. So that's the structure of it. Uh, we've also got a journal club coming up on this Wednesday. Uh, we will put the link to that paper in the DEF CON Discord. And then you, if you want to participate, you should join our Discord. Um, link in the Twitter bio. <laughs> yeah, it's in the Twitter bio. Um, and you can just DM one of us and I will give you an, send you an invite to the AI Village Discord. Please don't use the AI Village Discord while DEF CON is going on. Please be respectful of the um, hard work they have put in, into building their Discord and getting it running. Um, and only use it like tomorrow or Tuesday. So take it away, Rich. Okay. Cool. So this is actually a slightly older paper. It's from um, 2017. Uh, it is called Summoning Demons, the Pursuit of Exploitable Bugs in Machine Learning, which is probably one of the coolest paper titles I've come across in a while. Um, and it's by Rock Stevens and uh, Tudor Dimitris's group. So the basic idea of the paper, it's kind of an interesting spin on the adversarial ML papers uh, that I think started coming out about the same time. And in this, rather than actually like using the ML model itself to sort of guide inputs, uh, they're looking for more, they're more looking for flaws in how the different components of the system hook up. And to do that, they actually uh, crack out an old, old classic um, American fuzzy lop, the fuzzer, and they re-instrument a lot of it so that weird 
actions from the ML components of the system register as crashes to AFL. And so that lets them essentially do sort of like a black box adversarial attack, if you want to think of it that way, against the ML system. And what they find is that in addition to sort of the usual stuff you can get where you have like inputs that look like faces that don't register as faces because they've had some pixels perturbed, they also run into like image format parsing errors where a component of the ML system uh, won't parse, for example, a face correctly, completely fails to find the face, but if you open it, open it up in other programs, it actually looks good. So I, I think this is kind of um, in the vein of the same sort of things that um, Ariel Herbert Boss talks about a lot, where it's not just attacking the ML system itself that's important. You've got all of these other components in the, in the pipeline from ingesting the actual image all the way through feature extraction, pre-processing and so on. And each of those is actually a point that you can attack. And so in this paper, they're, they're basically using fuzzing as a way to find some of those, you know, broken assumptions or breakdowns in the link from, from one stage of processing to the next. Um, and, and I thought it was a super clever paper with a really good name and uh, they, they dig a couple of CVs out of it too. So um, super cool application of sort of more classic security methodology to um, what from my perspective is kind of an adversarial NL problem. So that's my, <laughs> that's my, um, I guess, like two minute summary of the paper. So I guess maybe to, to kick off conversation, um, is, so does this, do you feel like, does anyone have an opinion, strong opinion one way or the other, um, if this falls into the same sort of general field of adversarial ML as, as sort of like gradient-based attacks, like I'm trying to think of the name escapes me off the top of my head, like um, fast gradient sign method or like these Jacobian-based methods or saliency-based methods, um, or maybe even like, you could almost argue it's like a genetic algorithm-based attack against uh, a particular ML pipeline. Well, to be honest, I thought that adversarial ML covered all this already. I was a bit surprised that it was new. Um, yeah, it's it's... Um, genetic algorithm based because they're using fuzzy lock, which is mm -hmm. genetic algorithm based, which is also interesting because there were network uh, extensions, genetic algorithms that might be more appropriate if you're searching spaces. So there's some interesting stuff on the front that could be done. I, I kept wanting to say, what happened next? <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think I was in the context of. Uh, healthcare, you know, practical realities of securing systems. Like it seems like a lot more uh, emphasis right now uh, is placed on more theoretical attacks, where um, you know it's more so once you have like uh, uninhibited access to being able to query this API uh, that's being explored. So it's nice to see a paper like this that's uh, a bit more in the in all system side of things, uh, because I, at least from uh, like sort of uh, healthcare IT, it seems like it's a more more likely encounter that you'll find in, 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 in the industry. Yeah, I did. One thing that I did really like was their focus on implementations rather than just theoretical properties, right? Because, like, in some sense, a uh, a fast like something like the fast gradient sign method would um, apply to almost any of these models. But here, they're sort of like, okay, this model was instantiated in this way and is doing these things, and now how can we attack sort of that specific version of the model? Which I thought was was cool because it's yeah, it, it's it's a lot less academic in some ways, and a lot of the adversarial ML research seems to be very academic still. Yeah, this was like down and dirty, and how do we attack this thing? Uh, it's kind of in my vein of stuff, <laughs> which is look at the system, work out the, how to break the system, mm -hmm. and take it to pieces. I loved the way that they, they hack, that little hack on Fuzzy Lop, where they went, okay, we're going to take out the things that actually broke, and then we're going to induce breaks for the things we care about. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so the changing idea, the yeah. target. Yeah, yeah, changing the target. It was it was just beautifully done. I, I thought it would be useful for defense as well, um, because we're also looking now at things like um, you know Strace's work. Um, so Brittany Prostnikov's work on attacking with robots. What could we do 
to screw up their vision systems. Mm -hmm. So how, how could we we'd mess that? So there's some beautiful adversarial there too. Mm -hmm. Like if they can't see, they can't move. Yeah. So, yeah. I, so actually I thought table one in this was, I don't know, I'm, I'm surprised. Um, flips to table one. Flips to table one, yeah. table one. <laughs> it's, I think it's on page four. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, page so, four. Yeah, they actually like, I feel like, again, this is very much like uh, Ariel's jam, right? They go over sort of the attack surface and the kinds of things you can do to it. And it reminds me a little bit of the contest there was, so there, I think it was late, a late entry to the contest last year that was announced at the AI village where they were trying to do um, ML evasions. And um, one guy actually found essentially a bunch of ways to just completely trash the feature extraction so that the ML prediction act just wouldn't run on the samples he uploaded. Um, and so, yeah, he was, <laughs> he was a little upset that, that that didn't count as a win, which I think is justifiable, right? Because if you can just like stop the analysis cold, right? That's almost as good as evading it, but yeah. yeah. Um, it depends what you're trying to do. If you kind of sneak into a system and there's a bunch of systems, like right? yep. we just want to, you know, the usual thing, get in, do your thing, get out without anyone noticing. Yeah. Uh, and we, we see enough of that in real life of the stuff that's like, oh crap, we, we didn't realize that was a problem mm -hmm. before someone else adds them. Like, there's also another thing to that. Um, like if you want to attack the Ember, the Ember model with the Ember data set, it only looks at your headers and you could just change other parts. Like don't even think about it in terms of adversarial ML, just copy like a notepad.exe's header and just put your own um, uh, entry point function in and start launching weird stuff from there. And that's a different mm. way to bypass the thing that is also not aware, that academics also not aware of. Um, yeah, so that's sort of like, I guess that's, <laughs> Maybe um, like a, you could classify that if you were going to, I'm going to screw this up. So if, if I'm getting the terminology wrong, security people, please like yell at me. But it's almost sort of like a logic attack on the feature extraction rather than what they're doing here, which seems to be more going for, for crashes, right? If you know how the feature extraction process works, then you can sort of write your way around it deliberately rather than just throwing shit at it throwing shit at it until something blows up. Well, some of it's blowing it up. Some of it's sneaky in the back. Um, some of it's like sneaky in the back conventionally in depending on your system. I, mm -hmm. The other thing that interests me is that only some of these became CVEs. Mm -hmm. That the response to the people who are responsible for the algorithms, for some of this was like, won't fix and who cares? Mm -hmm. And that, that's part of our, our journey, I guess. It is yeah. just like every other security thing is trying to get people to accept that, yes, you may have to drop a little bit of um, responsiveness in your system, but you'll get it more secure. Yep. And it matters. Yeah. How is I, it going to matter? <laughs> I'm kind of reminded a little bit of some of the argument that went around for the uh, the proof point CVE, where, where people were arguing whether or not that actually counted as like an information leak CV because so if, if people aren't familiar, the short version is um, the people who did it, Will Pierce and someone whose name I'm forgetting, I'm sorry. Uh, they found a way to essentially like send an email through Proofpoint's um, spam detection service that would then bounce back to them. And in the header of the email, it had a score for, for how spammy it looked. And so that essentially was the information leak, the fact that they could get that score back and that was enough for them to rebuild essentially a proxy model for it. Um, and yeah, over on, the, in, in various like AI village discussion channels, we had um, very strong debates over whether or not that actually should have counted as like an information leak CVE because, you know, it's, in a lot of cases, it's useful contextual information, but when you look at it in an ML context, you're actually enabling like a model stealing attack, which again, it's one of these, we're kind of in new territory as far as the security of these ML based systems goes. And, and a lot of people that are more familiar with conventional security, maybe don't quite get what these various information leaks or um, attack surfaces could do once you wrap it in like how, how ML-based systems work. 
And I think another thing we get out of this is by doing this sort of attack, uh, we start showing where the, the things that break are. And one of the things I'd love about the fact that MLSEC exists is it makes machine learning better. Um, just by dint of the, the spotlight we throw on it. You chuck hackers at it, they take it to pieces to show you where it's, it's broken. And hell, we spend most of our life trying to get our damn systems to work. But I'm going to give you a little bit of history. I'm old. Oh, so sorry, old jump, in? Spot. Oh, yep. jump in for just a second. Yeah. Um, I just saw in the Discord chat. Oh, so yeah. it was Will Pierce and Nick Landers who got the Proofpoint CV. So I'm, I'm very Cute. sorry that I forgot your name, Nick. Okay, sorry, carry on. <laughs> well, I, I, was, I was just going to say about sort of um, some things they're finding, like it's double float precision thing. So way back before we had, I think we had Python, but we sure as hell didn't have scikit-learn and friends. We had matplotlib. I'm uh, not map, not map, map. We used MATLAB for a hell of a lot of machine learning stuff. And there was a neural network kit in the MATLAB. And that neural network kit suffered horrendously from underflow errors. Uh, you could break it really, really, really easily. So Aston University built its own. They, they built a, a separate kit because they couldn't get the first one fixed. I mean, the, this this sort of stuff, like the float to double errors. I mean, let, I mean, crossing my fingers that actually all of those hidden faults that are probably still going on with neural network stuff and deep learning, we're not even noticing because we just trust the systems. Yeah, I mean, even in even in Python, right? Like yeah. under the hood, a ton of these neural network libraries and PyTorch at least, sklearn as well, um, use Pickle, which is just broken kind of by default, right? It's a stack machine yeah. that you can write arbitrary code for. And yeah, uh, people still share weight files uh, that are essentially pickles. And so, you know, you're downloading this off the internet and <laughs> running code. And I keep threatening one of these days, I'm actually going to write a, uh, a pickle poisoner that is just like replaces calls to like the ReLU function with like some sort of stochastic function so that half the time it works and half the time it gives you garbage. Comment from uh, comment from Discord. Yeah, NumPy as well uses pickles. So it's it's everywhere. Keras, yeah. Is that what the nup save file is? The numpy save file? I thought that was secure. I'm not so, sure. I know. I'm pretty sure it has one. Um, one pickle thing in there. One or two. It's got one or two formats that. Um, yeah. That are are not. Ah. But apparently, there's a couple that. The the scikit learn vuln that these guys found uh, was numpy was part of that. I, I'm just yeah. flicking to the page. Page seven at the bottom. If you're reading along with us. One interesting thing is that they weren't able to induce like uh, misclassification or uh, from the uh, precision loss problem. So they, they tried it, different values of epsilon and basically said that it's possible in theory, but it's interesting to consider how would you model um, that epsilon to uh, based on this attack to, to induce this misclassification. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, how much of this is induced by uh, Basically, all the machine learning code is written by academics and over enthusiastic, like over enthusiastic academics, guilty, <laughs> um, who aren't experienced in uh, who like it's incredibly hard to write uh, numerically efficient code. So mm -hmm. you don't have time to like really learn how to like multiply matrices of incredibly efficiently and make sure you open files correctly. So you've, we've chosen a lot of lazy paths to formatting and opening things versus secure paths. Um, and also you've got tiny numbers and people don't, I mean, they, you go wading on in, build your stuff and don't think about how those numbers interact. You just mm -hmm. assume the system is going to magically deal with it. Yeah. And I mean, there's also the fact that writing secure code is very much its own skill set, right? You've got, you know, some people are writing research code because they don't expect it to be used in anger. They don't expect it to be used in a production context. Some people are writing numerically efficient code because that's their jam and God bless them. Um, and then you've got sort of security people who are, are probably gazing at a lot of this with sort of a feeling of vague horror that they're actually going into production. Yeah. I know even, um, yeah, in my, in my day job, right. A lot of, 
what we've been doing recently is sort of going back and and like rethinking how all of this stuff is put together so that we can like feel confident in actually like pushing out products containing it. Mm -hmm. There's a middle ground where you can enable basically more flexible code, but also execute it in a way that's um, perhaps minimizes the blast radius. And I mean, I don't mean put it in a container, obviously, but it's uh, something more uh, to the line of like running code in secure enclaves, for instance, the work with uh, silo uh, uh, type of uh, workflows, or uh, do you see anything where um, you try to mitigate the, the impacts of this code? And could we have code checkers? I mean, literally just some way, some sort of test data sets but we know this stuff is bad. Run it through through your system. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but how yeah. I mean, you... we. <laughs> I, I I had a great amount of fun. Um, again, at my day job, actually, like taking our feature extraction code and fuzzing it just to see what would happen with it. And you know, fortunately, it turned out that that it you know I spent more time than I care to think of beating on it, and it it turned out fine. But yeah, like if it hadn't, what would we have done then? Right? It would have been. And I think the idea of like building test vectors of just like, you know, really bizarre, but technically conformant files for this sort of thing is, is an awesome idea. Yeah, but extending that to the, uh, the actual data science part, like how often have you issued a PR about some data science thing and sent it to someone and they've gone, it looks good to me. Uh, but like a lot of the stuff, like there's some stuff that you can check easily, but like a lot of the, uh, the like a BERT, like the code that goes into BERT is incredibly complicated, very hard to check. When you make a small change, you could have broken things fundamentally because it's, uh, you know, software. How do you like write a unit test for I broke BERT when you input this one slight thing and now it, it uh, causes this whole class of things to be uh, false positives or false negatives. Like, how do you yeah, I mean, there's machine a, learning? Yeah. There's a, I mean, you can do, um, I mean, essentially you, you do test vectors, right? Yeah. You say, you know, if I load, because the weights, you can consider the, the weights are obviously like part of the model. You say, I've got this set of weights. If I load in, you know, this set of features, I should get this exact set of outputs up to like numerical precision, which again, it's, it's numerical precision is, is kind of its own nightmare, but um, yeah. But then if you change the weights, right. then, then kind of all bets are off. And that's, that's like the, one of the painful things about debugging ML, even when you're not under adversarial conditions is just, I retrained the model. Um, how do it? Do I still trust it? I mean, there's a difference between I messed up my models, which is like, we do this all the time. And somebody is actively trying to attack my models or may actively try to attack my models using mm -hmm. known, known vulnerabilities. Because sure as hell, half the system that's out there haven't patched any of this. But how many machine it, learning developers even know unit testing or even know good software mm -hmm. practices? Like they can't, a lot of us came from academia. I have a PhD yeah. in math, not software engineering. So I have a, a, a philosophical question I want to pose to the panel from uh, Discord. Um, and Yaga asks, what is an, a terror and, oh, sorry, what's a terror? <laughs> this is terror right here. Um, what is an error and what's an attack? And like, is there any meaningful distinction between the two? I guess I would follow up. I think if you're looking at adversarial images, I mean, the fact you have like the little image patches to screw up your system is an attack. It's not an error. You just don't randomly get sort of extra patches on a stop sign, you know, no matter how much undergrowth you got on it. I, I think the difference is intention. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's the same thing in security, right? Bugs can be, ex I mean, exploits are essentially software bugs, right? Uh, or I don't, maybe that's being too general, but if you, you know, a subset of software bugs or exploits and you use them to make the system do things you don't want, it it shouldn't be doing under normal circumstances. Or wasn't intended to be doing. Yeah. Right. And sometimes they're useful. Mm -hmm. Like, would you consider a well-informed person building an attack against a uh, machine learning system where they understand the machine learning system, they understand the feature extract and all that stuff, and they have, a, they've built a, a, you know, a false positive um, is that an adversarial attack against the machine learning or is that like an exploit? Uh, like, 
where would you classify the mistake? Is it like a software mistake or the uh, like, or a exploit or what? I think that's the tricky bit about ML models, right? Yeah. I mean, they're inherently statistical. Mm -hmm. So it kind of gets back to like testing after you retrain it, right? So I might, if, if, you ha if you have a single example and it turns out to be a false positive, and that's maybe that's one of the, the bridges that I feel like as a data scientist, I have to, to cross a lot when I'm talking to security specialists. If I have a model and it FPs on a single file, that doesn't call into question the efficacy of the model, right? You have to look at the statistics of what the model does, right? And if you say, well, yeah, it got this FP and, and that was a pretty boneheaded FP, but for 99% detection, you get one FP in, in 10,000 you know, negative samples. That's a pretty good model. And so being able to sort of like drive that switch from, hey, here's the, you know, here's the good, bad, um to hey you know you have to think of this sort of heuristically and statistically uh is is a big part of just like communicating as a data scientist i think but, with but the, i mean also I think, go sorry go ahead sarah yeah if you've got somebody actively attacking then maybe some pre-processing is enough to to cut down the attacks yeah it's yeah for sure right all, yeah. all of that goes out the window when you've got yeah. someone maliciously trying to yeah yeah but so my question is, so if you have like a fancy ML uh, from an academic paper bypass of um, your model where um, versus someone trying things, what would be, when is it like a machine learning mistake or versus a like a mistake in your featureizer and stuff? If you look at the, the decision boundary basically for something and, and like seeing how the perturbations uh, relate to that. Yeah, I kind of feel like maybe to, to pull it back to this paper a little bit, if it gets through your feature extraction process in one shape or if it like in one piece, then maybe like it's a modeling issue and if it like crashes your feature extraction process or it gives you something that like you wouldn't expect from your feature extraction process then then it's then it's a featureization bug right like yeah. if you if you feed garbage into a model you can't blame the model for producing garbage outputs which how would you basically what are some methods for quantifying like uh unexpectedness in this scenario is it more like error counts or like uh latencies in, in response like what, what would you pay attention to if you were trying to understand um if something was misbehaving you know what when you see it yeah like if you take a look in the in the paper right they've got an example i want to find it um figure two right so they show an example of two different images one is an image of uh sort of the, the very top of a person's head and then the rest of it is gray. And one is a picture of a that person's guy. person's head. Yes, there you go. Thank you. Um, page six, if you're following along. Well. Right. So OpenCV has a bug that these guys found by their uh, guided fuzzing technique, which means that OpenCV can't properly load the file. And then you run it, obviously you run it through feature extraction and it doesn't get anywhere. So it's like all these different individual components that you got to worry about, right? And I think on that topic, there was a, from Hacker Factor in Discord, he's got a question, are you making a distinction between the ML model versus software that drives the ML system? Um, he says fundamental error versus algorithmic. And I, I think here, right, this is what this paper is going, going after, right? It's saying the software that drives the ML system, the implementation of the system also has bugs and they find them here and, you know, if you, go to table table two, right? They've got in OpenCV, they've got uh, like two heap yeah. corruptions. They've got a weird rendering bug that they found. Page six, Page six thank you, yeah. Um, right, mm -hmm. so all these different, like they literally have like heap corruption bugs that they're discovering with these funky inputs. Um, and that has nothing to do with the model. That's you're, you're attacking the plumbing around the model, which is- But you can again, use that plumbing to go and tweak the model. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that's that's what the um the third line down does. That's the the figure figure one, figure two. I forget. Figure two. F figure right. two with the yeah. 
Yeah, so you break the rendering and then your the rendering goes to the feature extraction and the feature extraction can't get anything because it's just got a bunch of gray pixels to look at. And then the model, right, garbage in, garbage out. The model can't do anything because it doesn't have good features. So I'm going to try to open this up to Discord. Uh, awesome. So, uh, if you are in the DEFCON Discord, go to aavillage-general-voice. Uh, we'll try and mute you uh, and get you so you can talk um, if you're human plus that we may uh, that's the correct way to do it but we have a workaround so head over to AI village dash general dash voice to ask any questions um, if you can't we'll still be paying attention to the journal the text chat in AI village dash journal dash text the moment of truth dun, dun, dun. <laughs> I'm watching Journal Club text. Yeah, me too. Audio, <laughs> managing audio is, I'm so glad I don't have to deal with it. But, hey, um, I wish I had seen this paper before I started like really trying to solve adversarial machine learning as a security problem. Because there's a lot, this seems a lot easier, like, to attack for a lot of attack I think a lot of attackers have more knowledge in how to break a uh, parser than how to break a neural network mm -hmm. so this to me feels like more of a realistic threat model of like your uh, pipeline was they, they broke your pipeline you did something wrong in AWS you did something wrong with your uh, container set up and uh, it's parsing your images incorrectly now. Um, yeah, I mean, that's tons of the bugs that you find in sort of real systems, right, is, is parsing bugs. And yeah, I, a lot of a lot of the research right now um, focuses less on that and more on sort of these theoretical properties of you know, machine learning models, which, I, I mean, I don't want to dig on those. They're fascinating, right? I love these papers, yeah. but they're also, again, keep coming back to this paper. This paper makes the really good point that these sort of theoretical models that have these nice properties are embedded in real world systems. And we know that real world systems are always kind of full of bugs that can be attacked and exploited. And so it gives you sort of multiple entries into the problem, right? On the one hand, you can exploit the preprocessor and maybe that gives you some sort of heap corruption or, or some sort of like direct, you know, denial of service or, or even code execution. And on the other hand, you can break the feature extraction enough so that everything downstream is getting garbage data. Or mildly corrupted. I mean, I, I, I say right. again with like the sneaking in, you, you want to do low and slows on some of this. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, yeah. I, I, Again, I am really like the idea of using this as defense. I mean, there's a whole bunch of applications where the bad guys are using uh, machine learning based systems. I, I mm -hmm. like the idea of breaking their systems. Yeah. As, as I would. Great hats on. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Well, and... like Sorry, paper. go ahead. Yeah, just like yesterday's paper with um, the Forks masks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, Will has a comment. He says, I'm surprised a paper is the vehicle for this knowledge. There's a whole security industry that has advice for this stuff. And I think, yeah, this is part of what we're trying to do, right, with AI Village is draw a link between security and machine learning, right? So we have a lot of, like, wicked smart security people um, who know how about all about these implementation bugs. And then we've got a bunch of like really smart uh, academics and machine learning people who know about like sort of these, you know, feature-based attacks or, or weird properties of ML systems and getting sort of that knowledge transfer going on so that we can find out where those intersect and how those two, you know, sort of sets of attacks inform each other. I think that's like a really rich area for mm -hmm. future development and it, it kind of makes me sad a little bit that this paper came out in 2017 and, and got comparatively little attention um, when it really is going right to the heart of a lot of really big questions in this, you know, in ML slash security. So 
in practice, you see a lot of data science teams disconnected from both like infrastructure, application, network security uh, sort of uh, teams. And so like the whole uh, ML ops uh, sort of formation of teams that kind of interface between uh, data scientists and uh, implementation has, has been emerging. But I'm curious what the panel thinks as far as uh, what's the appropriate like role a person in a cross-functional team? Do we want to have security people sitting with data scientists as these things are being developed? And uh, for answer, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, weirdly enough, I used to be one of the people going into large companies working out where to put the data scientists. And there was always this argument between you want to embed the, the data scientists out into the rest of the team and have them work with because you're informing the rest of the team everywhere. Um, but then you've got data scientists out on their own. And we're kind of, you know, you see in this paper that it, we get ignored quite a bit on, when we're on our own. Or having these unicorn pens full of data scientists who talk to each other, but not really to anybody else. Definitely. And there's a sort of, yeah, sense of you, you put people out, but you make sure they're still part of tribe. So you, you literally build tribe or whatever the, the, the good word now is for that. It used to be called tribes. Uh, but cross village? Cross, yeah, village. Yeah, village. So you, you build villages for the data scientists to keep connected to each other, but they need to be out in the rest of the teams. Because yeah. otherwise, you know, we, 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 our work is everywhere. We should be everywhere too. That, that's it, strongly held belief though. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, but it's, it's got to be sort of a two-way street, right? On the one hand, yeah, there is kind of, for, for data scientists and sort of ML practitioners, I think that, yeah, we do sort of tend to stay in our own little bubble and don't think about these sort of ex externalities i don't know what the right word for it is but like these other ways you know it's not just going to be like fast gradient sign based attacks it's going to be like no someone someone broke the parsing but then at the same time and this is kind of going back to maybe a little bit of the hype panel yesterday like having people that aren't data scientists understand kind of like what the models can and can't do and what kind of behavior to expect from them so that they don't freak out when they see something weird happen and be like oh you know whatever we we flag this dll as being malware when it's not we're clearly under attack right and you're just like mm -hmm. it's statistics sometimes it makes mistakes well just explaining it's not magic it's yeah, hard exactly. but it's not magic <laughs> yeah it's hard it's useful it does cool stuff but it's a tool mm -hmm. yeah, is talking about implementing the security development life cycle and the secure software development like life cycle into model creation and upkeep. It'll make a data scientist cry. <laughs> yeah. I, this, I had issues with just being like, cool, we need to like just write a few unit tests to make sure that the functions all kind of do what they're supposed to do. Um, there are, there's a bit of pushback in our, for some of our, from our more academically minded folk of like just a little bit of basics like that. Um, which may have solved some of these like open CV issues because I. The... Interesting that um, if you basically treat um, the life cycle of like a, a data project as a more of an internal product for like a company and treat it as a product that, which has which serves a purpose, provides value, and then uh, is is integrated with other ways of developing software products, then. It, data science and machine learning, they just become tools in an engineering toolbox, but then everything else falls within like methods of like, continuous integration and testing and delivery. So then perhaps there is hope, rather than the unicorn pens, data scientists. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's what we're doing. We're doing things like uh, hypothesis based um, development, which is like the, the next thing up from behavior based development, uh, which is next thing up for test based develop, um, test, test driven development. So you very much like work out what the universe you'd like to see is go do the go do the maths on it build the systems in it so there there are ways of working yeah, yeah so maybe looping sorry go ahead Sven. No, go ahead Rich. yeah so i was gonna gonna loop back to the paper one more time um and talk about the disclosure experience that they they mentioned towards the end of the article so basically they they got three of the vulnerabilities got new cves um because they enabled arbitrary code execution or denial of service attacks, right? So those are both very firmly within the wheelhouse of what people... Page seven. Page seven, thank you. 
very much within the wheelhouse of what security people think of as, oh yeah, this is that's a bug, that's an issue, that's a security gap that we need to fix. But um, there were a couple of other ones that they found um, where they could impact or manipulate the prediction. And then they, they call out in particular the mouth here, memory corruption they found, where basically they can rewrite the feature vector, which um, allows you to basically like make the model give you any output you want, essentially. Uh, doesn't have to have anything to do with what the actual file that you were analyzing was. And those specifically are the ones that didn't get the, uh, didn't get a CVE, didn't get called out and mostly got labeled as won't fixed or, or as won't fixed. Yeah. So that's sort of like, you know, we, we were kind of bashing the data scientists earlier saying, oh, you know, we got to like think of this as part of a security system. But then it goes back the other way, right? We need to be able to communicate to people that as data scientists, as machine learning experts, look, you know, this is, this is bad, right? And how do we convince people that, you know, something that allows arbitrary misclassification or arbitrary predictions to be, to be produced is as serious as, or maybe not as serious, but but has some degree of severity, just like a remote code execution or a denial of service. I like the example that Eric brought up in his talk of a turtle rifle. Uh, like that is a very effective way of communicating potential problems. Where for those who haven't seen it, uh, like a, a, a turtle, uh, a 3D printed object that have, uh, be applied to a turtle to make it misclassified, uh, be misclassified as a rifle. You can imagine like systems that uh, you know, track security of uh, for, like students stuff the two induce certain events. I mean, it's like any other ethics discussion. We have to talk about consequences and then track it back and just keep pushing and pushing the examples, real examples, if we've got them. It, it's, it's hard. It's... Yeah, I mean, I guess like that's, you, you, you have a joke, but we're not really a joke that like airline regulations are written in blood. Right. And so when you've got all of these safety requirements, it's because a lot of people got hurt before someone was like, oh, we ought to do something about that. And it would it would be nice to think that we could we could find a way to not have like ML disclosure requirements written in blood. Right. Like maybe, you know, let's let's we're we're at a place now where we could maybe like jump ahead of the game a little bit and and get an understanding of this out there so that we don't have to see people hurt before people are like, oh yeah, we should maybe take that seriously. I actually have a historical example for that too, <laughs> for, for being old. So I ran one of the unmanned air vehicle safety teams back in the day before UAVs were sexy. And we didn't have the um, privilege, I guess, that the, SP, the rest of the airspace industry had so aerospace regulations are literally written in blood. So an aircraft would crash into something else or hit the ground and you would change the regulations. And that's literally how the regulations were written. Same with fire safety. Fire happens, change the regulations. Um, and we were told explicitly and understood explicitly that we couldn't just put UAVs into manned airspace, have them crash into stuff, and then rewrite the world rules. We literally had to think all the scenarios and write the rules for how to do it safely. And it's whole space safety, not just individual aircraft safety, before we were allowed to, to fly in the same spaces. So there, there's some precedent. I mean, there's maybe some looking in those spaces to see how it was done well as a good way to look. But a lot of it's just getting the will. No, nothing in focus is <laughs> attention like a whole bunch of airliners about to crash. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, you know, we could maybe get there before that point. That would yeah. be <laughs> so. Um, one more question from Discord, which uh, is good because that's where I wanted to go next. Um, so Yaga has the question, how do we force open source software to fix itself? We don't fix it ourselves. That's why it's open source. And the authors actually make a comment in the future work um, where where they, they say that it's unclear who should be responsible for fixing them as well. So um, when they found a bug in, in the Malheur feature processing, that was because Malheur relied on LibArchive. Uh, and the bug was actually in LibArchive. And again, this gets back to this notion of like, you have all these different components that feed into the system. Um, so even though the bug was in LibArchive, it affected Malheur. So where do you, 
where do you put the responsibility for fixing it and how do you convince you know like whoever's maintaining lib archive look this is serious enough that you know yes i don't think it doesn't affect you directly but it does affect this other system and it could be a critical impact like how do we how can we navigate that sort of um uncertainty yeah how does linux and uh like ubuntu and others separate open source software ecosystems do it like, do they have liability I mean, I know for a lot of systems, the end users, especially if they're big end users, just get involved with the open source communities and work in there. But uh, if you're using even like Python and your physical system crashes, who's responsible? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of licensing argument. A lot of licensing agreements basically say, like, yeah, you agree that you're using this at your own risk, too. So, you know, basically everyone's going around like, not me, which, you know, it's fair, right? And people have, like, they have, they can't assume liability for, for everything that they do, but, um, you know, and they, they can't agree to fix, uh, fix every single thing. But at some point, right, there's there's a balance, right? If something's widely adopted, it's widely used, and there's like a bug three steps up the chain that's that's causing it to behave weirdly. It feels like somebody ought to, there ought to be like some impetus to fix yeah. it somehow. Long tail companies like Fortune 500s and whatnot that use these open source libraries, then in theory, you know, this is AI, so you have a lot of like, um, boost in productivity, like, and there's a lot of value that's being derived, and especially if they're starting to use it for critical applications that, uh, or decisions. So I, I think the onus of responsibility also needs to fall in the end users of like widely adopted packages, and then somehow make it, making it very clear to decision makers in those companies that, hey, if you're using this to predict insurance rates or something and uh, it fails, that's what you could you know, potentially face, and then somehow channeling that into the projects themselves. Are you proposing that large companies that make a lot of money using open source tools should actually give back to the open source community? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Smells like communism like to me. <laughs> it's um, kind of terrifying that we all just laughed when you said that. <laughs> yep. Sorry, I um, gotta get my gotta get my commentary in once in a while. Uh, it, these are complex systems, and like just communicating uh, the impact of some small like overflow bug to somebody who only cares about like the bottom line is is is, is, is a problem. Uh, maybe there needs to be like a awesome ML failures GitHub repository or something like that where you can yeah. find it. To, we haven't had what that. That sounds like actually a pretty good weekend project for someone. Yeah, I mean, like you know, when we started up the ethics stuff years ago, it just just takes some people determined to make this thing a thing, a visible thing. Yeah. Hey, community. Anyone want to take this one on? But so, how many like solid examples of ML failure do we have? If we want, I mean, to a lot of it is compile those. Yeah. How much do we actually know? Yeah, yeah. that's. Um, I want to say uh, Andrew Davis uh, over in different Discord had a uh, pretty good comment on it, which is that a lot of time when ML fails, it kind of fails silently. Right, it just you you don't flag something, and it comes back to a lot of the earlier discussion about is it is it a bug or is it like normal, just sort of like statistical failure? Right, a one percent a one percent failure rate means that if it's not failing one percent of the time, you should be vaguely surprised, right? So, yeah, like I think it's possible that there's a lot of ML failures that we just kind of assume are in the statistical noise. A lot of them are probably kept quiet because, you know, there's potentially like PR risks or PR damage, right? Or, you know, like like actual like gross, you know, liability attached to it. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an open question how much is, is actually sort of flying beneath the radar out there. Imagine a rental company say, or a background check company who uses ML going, uh, so we didn't give a lot of people their, uh, approve, you know, their credit check approval because of a mistake. And we want to publicly apologize for that when it's an ML mistake. And they can just be like, well, the model just was, you know, sweep it under the rug, fix it quietly, never mention it. Yeah. Like that would be an ethical nightmare. Yeah. I mean, there's lots of <laughs> startups, um, that have proposed to do things. There was one, what was it, about 
two, three years ago, which was like, oh, we'll use ML to like pre-screen your babysitters by like digging through their social media profiles and stuff, right? And I have my own opinions on how likely that was to succeed versus how long it, how much, how likely it was to simply just like recommend white people but um you know like how do you how do you even like measure or quantify failure failures in that case right because it's all going to be completely internal and all you're going to all like all you can do is you know essentially like try and like get a proxy model to be like aha here are the features right i've submitted a thousand different profiles and here are the features that seem to be like triggering right and that's you have to like affirmatively dig for it, right? Those failures aren't going to be obvious unless you're actually doing something like that. Um, Recent streak of sort of facial recognition uh, failures that lead to uh, incorrect arrests or several other kinds of like that, that elicits like a visceral gut reaction like, yes, this is wrong. So I, I think in, in, in some cases, just like seeing it, like the outcomes, like Clara said, you know, helps to understand whether it's like a failure. This gets back yeah, I mean, so the bias question, like, how do you tell if something's yeah. biased or just like for this one instance, you were wrong? It was wrong. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah. Can't work. We're going to have to clean that one out, Sammy. Yeah. Racial how... bias in, in images is, oh, God. <laughs> yeah. How much longer do we have for this conversation? <laughs> uh, yeah, we can solve it in eight minutes. We've got eight minutes. Yeah, yeah. No problem. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the problem, the problem in a lot of the bias stuff, right, is like, the terms aren't even defined sometimes. So like the, the, the example I keep coming back to is like recidivism and like predicting re-arrest rates, right? And someone might point out, hey, look, we, we, you know, this is biased, right? It's clearly predicting re-arrest rates that are much higher for this group, right? And one argument we would be, well, that's clearly wrong, right? They're, you know, it's biased because it's trained on biased data. And the counter argument would, would be like, look, it's reproducing the data, right? It, we don't live in a perfect society. This, the data is what it is. And within that box, you, the ML has done as much as you can ask it to do, right? And so it always come, it always boils down to these normative questions. And in, this is my own totally personal opinion that you, you can't like talking about unbiased systems, unbiased ML is, is almost inherently impossible, right? It's, it's yeah. a question of how is it producing the kinds of outcomes that you want and how is, how is the ML system moving power around, right? Who is it empowering? Who is it disenfranchising? And, you know, who is it helping and, and who is it, who is it hurting? And, chasing after some like vague notion of fairness, you know, a fair system or an unbiased system is, is kind of like a distraction from like more fundamental questions of like, who's being helped, who's being hurt, what, what's being reinforced or whose concerns are being downplayed. And who's accountable, I guess, also because of like yeah. reference recent Twitter storm between Tim Gibber and Yalakon, basically like, is it the email engineer or is it actually the data scientist or is it throughout the entire chain? Yep. But yeah, like, and I mean, sorry, go ahead. I'm talking too much. I'm, I'm seeing um, over in the chat that we already have awesome ML failures in the AI village as a, as a repo. And Stellar Athena seems to be um, getting in there already. It's, outstanding. With, um, the suggestions for implementation failures, ethical failures, HCI failures, and security failures. Okay. You got that, Stella? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, do we do we have a category for because we we were playing around with this cat does not exist um, a couple of days ago. I think we maybe need a category. This ML should not exist. Yeah, nightmare fuel. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I'm thinking of things. Yeah, like... Yeah, you're right. There are how a bunch of machine learning systems that just should not be on this planet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And anyone asked to contribute to it should have been like, mm, perhaps not. Um, but yeah, I mean, as. As far as the yeah, responsibility, and we would never too, have had Facebook if anyone had had, had that call. Um, anyway, <laughs> I mean hindsight, but you yeah. can look at like really uh, short-term stuff, like um, even just like genderify, right? It was should have been pretty obvious to everyone involved that this was just like a losing proposition from the start. Yeah, yeah, and the recidivism through face images stuff from China. Oh and... God! Yeah. Okay. Hey, so hey, way to replicate somebody's <laughs> yeah. biases. 
So we, we do have, we do have, I, I just, so we do have a, a workshop coming up in a couple of minutes. So I think I want to kind of like put a pin in this. I think if everyone's enjoying this conversation, Stella's having an awesome ethics in AI panel, which is coming up in a couple of hours. I'm not sure someone, someone fill me in. Uh, two o'clock, two o'clock. Two o'clock. Thank you. So everyone should absolutely turn, tune in for that if they're enjoying this discussion. Um, but yeah, I guess I want to just like go around just to wrap this up um, and see if we have any like last minute, like big idea takeaways from this paper that people thought were really, really cool. Uh, I love the way they did it. Um, the idea of attacking the system and looking at taking it apart is just kind of my thing. And I like the idea of using it to attack systems that I that shouldn't exist. Yep. It's fun. Uh I really like the idea of attacking the feature extractors, and I think it, we should also add like bypassing the feature extractors by just doing something that the you know the ML system is going to miss uh, because you understand it well to this whole thing. Cool, Barton. Yeah, that also really enjoyed the paper and discussion. Um, I I, th I think um, to me. Uh, what was clear is that it can occur on many levels of the um, uh, basically stack. So just you know, instrumentation and stuff become very more important to monitoring what happens. And then I would really like to see follow-on work that uh, applies this to TensorFlow, PyTorch, basically deep learning libraries and seeing how you can play with uh, intermediate representations and things like that to induce certain things. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, the reminder that like these ML things, ML products don't exist in some abstract theoretical space and are implemented in real code in real systems that come with their own flaws was yeah at, like you know it but being reminded of it sort of viscerally by look we have cves is always is always a great thing so cool um so i think this is we probably want to leave a few minutes for people to fight with the audio as we transition over to the workshop so um i think we want to call that a panel so or a, a discussion so awesome um, thanks everyone thanks Rich. one second Oh. Before we jump off, uh, we have one on Wednesday at 5 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, and we have the, the, I'm guessing, I think we should go with your paper, Rich. The, uh, the slide deck on? Yeah, the anomaly okay. detection uh, outside the closed world on using machine learning for network intrusion detection by Robin Subban and uh, Vern Paxson. Yeah. Um, so we'll post that in the the uh, def one discord and also be posted to our discord and twitter so if you want to participate you should find your way over to our discord we can't post a link to that in uh, the def one discord but the links are places and you can just dm us for an invite uh, and we'll be discussing that for probably an hour and a half on uh, wednesday and we might be able to get one of the authors in even though that this is a 10 year old paper how far we have come <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Catch you later.